Hey guys, it's been a hot minute since we've had a chat, but I'm glad to be back. And I thought I'd do something, a little something for you guys by doing a little list of things I've figured out how to help me stop procrastinating and just do the thing I plan on doing already. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have your own creative, you know, things that you want to do. And you sometimes get caught up in pretty much everything else and you're trying and you're trying to work through writer's block or art block or whatever. So this can help this can help pretty much anybody who needs uh, who needs something to stop procrastinating. All right. So here's my list and and there's 12 points in it because I thought I'd give you a little something extra instead of just 10. All right. Number one is find a time that works for you. If you're a night owl, do the thing at night when you're feeling when you're feeling at your most energetic. If you're more of a morning person, do it in the morning, uh, right after you've had your cup of coffee. You know, any number of things to any number of times or places that make you feel comfortable. You know, but but do it at the time that works best for you. Number two is do warm ups. Uh, you know, you know how uh, professional professional athletes uh, have their warm ups. Well, and artists have to do warm ups too. And for for people who love to draw, they may do a quick a uh, quick sketch before working on on their main piece and for writers we should do the same thing and it means writing a, a brief little drabble or what have you before you uh just to get yourself in the mood just uh before you start you know it makes things so much easier and it helps your brain click into gear okay so just try doing a little a little warm-up drabble if you're a writer do do a quick little sketch if you're an artist you know if you're if you're a vocalist do some vocal exercises so on and so forth warm-ups will help you get in the right frame of mind number three is start small if you're working on a major project then break it down into its smallest forms you can't write an entire book without writing writing a chapter first so think about the, uh, think about only worrying about the chapter when when you're fo uh, when that is your focus or or even if a chapter is too big for you because a chapter can be like 10,000 words if you want it to be if that seems too big then just focus on the, on the first few paragraphs that you have to work on break the process down to as small pieces as possible for you to wrap your head around instead of trying to think about the size of the full project itself. It'll save you a lot of grief and a lot of anxiety. Number four is pace yourself, which means some, which means that different paces work for different people. Some people have no trouble right, doing NaNoWriMo every year or multiple times a year because they also got Camp NaNo and whatever else. I've tried that. I've tried that. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work for me because I'm a slow writer most of the time. You know, I generally cannot write more than say 15 to 20,000 words in a month. And I understand that that is my pace because I've, I've spent a long enough time writing to understand my limits, which, uh, which is another one coming, uh, coming up, but pacing yourself means that you don't try to work at a breakneck speed every single minute of every day until the project is done. You will burn yourself out that way. So, so take a nice leisurely pace that is the at the middle point of what you can of what you can do. You know, and on a day where you're really feeling your energy, then yeah, go go all the way, go hard. But if but if you're not, you know feeling up to it, don't, don't beat yourself up for only managing like one sentence. It's not going to kill you. You'll be fine. Okay. So number five is respect your limits. 
And this goes back into what I was saying before with pacing. Everybody has different limitations. Not all of us are physically able and strong every single moment of every day. You've got plenty of not neurodivergent creators. You've got plenty of chronically ill creators. And we all have a different amount of, shall we say, spoons. You know, you've probably heard that. We all have a different uh, different selection of spoons in, in an average day. So don't, uh, don't demand your, of yourself that you use every single spoon that you have and then still beat yourself up for, or for falling short. Use what the energy you can, you can give in the way that you find most productive, which means if you genuinely don't have the energy for the day, then that's okay. You know, just, uh, just write it off as a mental health day. And then when you're, when you're feeling stronger tomorrow, you can definitely get, uh, you can definitely get your, uh, get yourself together and work on it and work on the project more, you know? Um, because, well, this, this came up for me recently, pers uh, personally as well. And by that, I mean last night because I had a session with, with my co-author Nicole and I wasn't, I wasn't feeling up to it. So I told her, I'm sorry, I, but I'm really tired. We're going to have to cut this short. And you know what she said? She said, that's okay. Because the fact was we still made progress on, on the thing. It just wasn't as much progress as I might've liked, but we still made progress anyway. And we got another session coming up on Saturday. So no harm, no foul. Okay. So just, show yourself the same the same kind of respect you know that you would a friend who's having a rough day if you're low on spoons it's not gonna kill you okay so uh the next one because that was five next one is set reasonable goals you know which means don't expect to write fifty thousand words by day one and if you and if you are a slow author don't even expect to write a thousand words in a single day you might be able to do it and you might not. My average is about maybe 500 words a day. And that's it. And that's if I'm going at a much faster pace. You know, generally it takes me a couple of days to write a thousand words. You know, so a reasonable goal for me would be, you know, to write, to write 10,000 words in about two weeks. You know, so that would be a, re a fairly reasonable goal for me, that that 10K in two weeks. But it wouldn't be it wouldn't be reasonable for me to write it in one week. Likewise, if you if you respect your limits and you pace yourself, like I mentioned before, then you know how to set reasonable goals for yourself and setting reasonable goals prevents you from burning out in a long haul thing like a, a like a book or a particularly detailed painting or anything like that, depending on what kind of creator you are. And if you're, this also goes for YouTubers as well. You know, if you, if you set reasonable goals and pace yourself and so on and so forth, like I mentioned earlier, then you won't, you won't run out of steam so quickly and you won't run the risk of creator burnout. Okay. So number seven is reward yourself, which means when you make progress, any kind of progress at all, especially if it's a rough day, give yourself a nice little treat. One of the things that I've been doing for myself uh, while, while editing the audio for the Apocryphal Musings audiobook is every time I'm, d I'm done with, uh, with editing one of the poem, uh, one of the audios for the poems, I then watch a few minutes of YouTube to kind of give myself that mental fill up and, you know, give myself a mental recharge that I can focus on something else other than the thing I have to do. So then I can dive back into it in, in a little bit, but having that reward system, the little, the little carrot dangling makes you more want to do the, oh, more will, more wanting and more willing to do the thing. So, so yeah, definitely, definitely treat yourself when you've made progress. Even if it isn't a ton of progress, you, you'd be surprised how, how after writing a paragraph, giving yourself a, a, giving yourself a chocolate chip cookie will really, really encourage you to do more. 
So number eight, number eight is schedule your time. And this goes back to what I said all the way back at the beginning of this video, finding the time that works for you. Once you find the time, you have to schedule the time, which means that no matter what comes up in your life, you have, you have to focus on that thing. And it, because the fact of the matter is if you don't take, if you don't take your art seriously, nobody else will either. So the best thing to do to take it seriously is to basically treat it like it's a part-time job. If you have, if you have it scheduled into your life and show up to do the work, then you'll be, then you'd be surprised how quickly your, your focus changes. I meet with Nicole multiple times a week and it's always at 7 p.m. and I always meet up with her. Even, even in a case like yesterday where, where we had to cut it short, I always make sure to show up. And you'd be surprised how much you're willing to do for yourself when you show up the same time every time, whether it's every weekend, every couple of days, every day, whatever the case may be, whatever works for you, schedule the time, then show up. Number, number nine, hold yourself accountable to someone. That means letting somebody know what you've got planned next in terms of your project and then telling them to remind you to do the thing. And it also, it also means when, with other family, other family members, so on and so forth, when you've blocked out the time saying, I'm going to do the thing now, please nobody bother me. You know, that's something I should have mentioned earlier, but, but it still applies here, you know, because you're making yourself accountable by announcing the thing. Part of the thing that I've done in, in order to make myself accountable is telling you guys about my projects. So that way, you know, it, uh, those of you who are waiting for those projects are going to be like, oh, where's the thing? Where's, where, when's the thing coming out? So that means, that means I have the right kind of pressure, the right kind of peer pressure to, to do the thing. And you'd be surprised how well that works. Um, Number 10 is, and you're going to love me for this, expect the first draft to suck. And I do mean suck because the first draft of anything, whether it's the first draft of a piece of art, the first draft of a piece of writing, a poem, whatever, it's not going to be exactly the wonderful thing that you hope for because because in the process of trying to get whatever's in your head onto, onto a, phys, a physical page or what have you, you're basically gonna, gonna do whatever your creator equivalent is of word vomit. <laughs> That's what I call it as an author. I basically word vomit onto the page and then, and then through the process of editing, I change things around so that makes sense. But if you expect the first draft to completely suck, then you'll be pleasantly surprised at how, at how well you've written as opposed to hating yourself for not instantly turning out the best thing ever written since Shakespeare. <laughs> okay. Number 11. Number 11 is, and this is a very popular one among writers to kill your darlings. Now, what that means is you might have little favorites in your manuscript that you think are the, are the best things since sliced bread, but they don't really serve the story. You know, it might be a little, a little pithy, little bit of dialogue that you just love for some reason. And that's okay. And that's okay because I'm, I'm very much a dialogue kind of gal. I love smart dialogue and I love those Joss Whedon-esque you know, snappy, snappy comebacks, you know, and not all of them are winners, no matter how much you think they are, because not, because not all the time do they serve the story, do they make sense for, for the character to say, or, and, and those are the times when you have to be willing to let them go. You know, as fun as the, those little things are, 
turning the story into its best possible version is the most important, which means that awesome bit of dialogue or that awesome little bit of description might have to go. And you have to be willing to accept that because, because it's, it's basically, oh, we got rumblies. It's basically taking, taking a pruning shear to, to, to the thing that you're growing. And that means you're going to be cutting out some healthy bits as well as the sickly bits in order to give it the right shade, you know? And so, yeah, be willing to kill your darlings and you will turn out like the best possible piece of art that you, that you can do. And finally, number 12, and this is going to be hard to accept for a lot of you. I know it can be hard to accept for me, but sometimes you have to be willing to let go. Not just killing your darlings in, in the little bits and pieces, but sometimes the entire piece of art, the entire writing, what the entire video, whatever thing you're working on is, sometimes it simply doesn't work. And, you've, and if you've given it your best and it's just not gelling, sometimes you have to do what is known in the writing business as trunking that piece meaning you lock it away into a little physical or metaphorical trunk, you know, it does that mean it's gone forever? No, it, it means that you're setting it aside for, uh, so that you can have an opportunity to, to do other art, you know, and it's not, it's not pointless to create a piece of art and then trunk it because a piece of art that has been trunked has still served its purpose. It taught you a lesson about yourself as a creator. You learned from the experience. So even if you don't get to share that experience with others, it still has meaning. Art inherently has whatever meaning you give it. So if you're willing to let go and trunk it for years, months, whatever the case may be, until you until you're ready to maybe pick it up again in the future, if you so choose, you know, maybe in the future, you'll be able to write that story better. Maybe not. Who the heck knows? Maybe it's something that you'll be, you know, occasionally tease yourself with. Maybe it's something that you'll look back on and, and laugh a little. I mean, I basically chunked 90% of the content I had here on my YouTube channel at, uh, at the time. And it was the best decision that I ever made is, is, but you know, it's still accessible elsewhere. And, and there, but there's also videos that I haven't released because, because I made that decision and it's made, it's made me a better content creator in the process. It helped me decide what I really want to do with my channel. So you have to be willing to, uh, to do that for whatever art you're creating. Sometimes you have to be willing to put the thing away if it's not working out. So on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, and because, because I'm a, I'm obviously a content creator myself, you know, I'm, I'm a writer of course, and I just want to help out any of you guys who have, who are inspired creatively, but are also struggling. So, so if you, if, so if this list was helpful for you, give that like button a click and subscribe. I will have more videos like this to help, uh, to help other content creators, you know, as well as other fun little, little, fun little stuff I plan on doing as well, you know, but let me know down in the comments, what other things that you do to help stop procrastinating on a project that you're working on, or if you're still struggling with procrastination and tell me if you've tried any of these things and how they worked for you, because everybody, everybody's brain is different. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.